All right, good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you here. This is our uh, Sunday morning service for August the 14th. We're glad you're here, and we pray that God blesses you for being here. I remember if you're watching this online, our goal is to get you in the building or at least in our parking lot where you can meet with other people and other Christians and, and have fellowship with them uh, because that's what God wants. But if you are listening to this at home, remember to get your Lord's Supper, your bread, your uh, uh, grape juice, and have a Bible with you and follow along with us. And we hope that you sing at home as well. It's uh, good to see all of you that are here. Uh, we're glad the Lord has blessed you. Uh, just have one thing to say about outside. I don't know how hot it's going to get today, but make sure you have your cars on and your air conditioner on because it's going to be hot out there. If you see somebody in the parking lot that looks a little bewildered, make sure they know that our new receiver station needs to be 90.5. 90.5. So if you see somebody that's looking kind of strange, um, other than when I'm preaching, that's probably why. And just let them know that it's 90.5 on your radio if they want to sit out there in the audience. Our brother Don will be directing our song service. All of our songs are on the overhead. If you need a book, they're underneath. Make sure that you get one. If you need a book out in the, out in the, in the parking lot, um, say something. I know Don's in here. He's doing the, the song service. So our other deacon Troy's not here. At least I, don't, I haven't seen him. So uh, we'll have to get somebody out there to, to help you if you need something out there. Um, it's good to see you all here. Uh, remember that we will have a We Worship, and we really appreciate Brother Sandy and all the work that he does uh, in doing that. And uh, every Sunday he tells me how much noise and ruckus there's going to be in the back room during the sermon, uh, because he says this time you're going to hear a lot of animals uh, um, uh, roaring and, and growling because they're talking about creation. Uh, in there. So we appreciate all the work that he does and, and all the crafts that he gives the kids to take home and to remind them of all these wonderful classes. All right, we're going to be singing song number 186. And so if you would sit up straight and let's praise God together. Just one more thing. Since Troy's not here, Chad, can you do me a favor? The CD's ready to go before Mike starts doing the sermon. Can you hit play? Because <laughs> I don't think he wants me running back and forth anymore. Okay. Oh, I missed Thank you for doing that. Okay, 186. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the
his death, burial, and his resurrection it gives us a great hope. Beneath that cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the will. good to see everyone in here and the few people that I got to see in the parking lot uh, as I told somebody we were running short of deacons this morning so if I miss anyone in the parking lot who does not have the communion elements would you please honk your horn and I'll see if somebody can bring it to you and I don't hear anyone so I want to just tie a couple of things together this morning. Um, I know several times I've, I've been up here and I talk about the bread being the body of Jesus. And that's not just me saying that because it sounds good. But it all started in the, in the Old Testament. Remember when uh, Moses brought the Israelites through the uh, Red Sea? And within just a matter of days, they started grumbling because they didn't have any food. And they said, oh, why didn't you let us die in Egypt? instead of come out here to this desolate place. And they brought it before Moses, and Moses brought it before the Lord. And in Exodus verse 16, he said, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether or not they will walk by my instruction. 
On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. And what are we that you grumble against us? Because they were grumbling against Moses and Aaron. And then to follow that up, in John... Um, chapter 6 starting in verse 41 it says therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he had said I am the bread that came down out of heaven hmm They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? And he said, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall, be all, they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learn from the Father comes to be. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. You can't make this stuff up, folks. This is directly, I mean, it's printed in red. I know Jesus said it. <laughs> And then he goes on to say, This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. And then in, I know we, we just seem to run this verse in the ground, but it seems to be just a nice follow-up for, for what I'm saying. In 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread that we are about to partake of is not just an it does not represent Christ's body. Christ said, this bread is my body. And, you know, when we, when we pray for a meal at home, we pray, let this nourish our bodies so that we can gain strength. The same way we pray with this bread, let it nourish our spirits so we have strength, so we have boldness, so we can be more like Jesus. The wisdom in that is just phenomenal to me. Will you please bow with me? Father God, we thank you so much. We are in awe as we stand before you at this time, prepared to partake of your son's body the living bread. Those who eat this bread will have eternal life. We are in awe of your love, your compassion, your promises that we are not saved by our own merit, 
we can't do enough good, we can't be good enough, we never have, we never could, but you saved us based on the bread that you sent from heaven, Jesus Christ and his body. We thank you for Jesus, for all that he does for us, for all that he has promised us, for all he has given us, especially eternal life, so that we can be with you in heaven throughout eternity. Be with each one of us now as we partake of this bread, that we would do so in a way that's pleasing and acceptable to you. Help our minds to go back to the cross as we will learn more today about Jesus' crucifixion. We praise your name and thank you. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we continue with the cup, Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father God, we continue our prayer that we are truly amazed at your compassion at your love for us, a people that do not deserve your love. But we thank you, Father, that as those of us who love you and have come up out of the waters of baptism, we know that you have, you have clothed us with Christ and that you no longer see our sins, but you see the blood of the covenant that covers our sins and being clothed with Christ we know that we are welcome to the feast Father again as we partake of this cup bring back to our minds that that gruesome vision of Jesus having been beaten having had the thorn of crowns beaten into his skull having his side pierced his hands pierced his feet pierced it's not a sterile picture that we see from an artist's rendition but in reality that blood that we see on the cross covers our sins and we thank you for your, for your wisdom and your compassion for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. think there's anyone here who could deny the blessings that the Lord showers upon each and every one of us. Whether we're Christians or not, Jesus has said that it rains on the just and the unjust. That's a blessing from God. Not just for us, but for the whole world. 
every blessing that we see, that we know, comes from God. Now it's our time to give back a portion of that, that which, which truly belongs to Him anyway. Would you please bow with me. Father, again, we thank you for everything that you do for us, everything you give us, especially eternal life through Jesus Christ. We pray that you bless the funds that are collected today. And Father, we just ask that these funds would continue to be used for evangelism in this community, for benevolence of those that we love. Pray that you be with each one of us as we give joyfully, not grudgingly, from our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Good morning, saints. Good morning. I thank you for your prayers. My eyes now are normal. You look like zombies to the skeletons now. Okay. <laughs> We're taking a reading from John chapter 9, verse 25 through 30. It reads as follows. Therefore the soldier did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of vinegar wine was standing there so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth therefore when Jesus had received the sour wine he said it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost thank you We're going to be looking at John's record of Jesus' statements on the cross. There are seven statements, but John only dealt with three, and so that's what we're going to deal with since we're dealing with the book of John. Remember that as we began the study of the book of John, I uh, want to remind you that God's Word is returning back to God to prepare a place for His people and to prepare a kingdom, that kingdom that God had promised, which the Jews misunderstood and which most people or many people today misunderstand as well. But in order to do that, Jesus needs to make the way for sinners to come to God. And that's what the cross is all about. Let me remind you that Jesus was taken to be crucified in John 19, 17 through 18. Pilate uh, crucified him even though he thought he was innocent in verses 19 through 22. And then we had the activity that was done at the cross after they actually nailed him on the cross. They not only nailed him, but then they... they um, divided up his garments, and they cast lots for one of his, his uh, robe, and we talked about that. And today what we want to notice is as it continues, we want to notice what goes on as Jesus makes his first statement. And that statement I'd consider, I would uh, suggest to you, is a statement that I call a statement of human care. In other words, Jesus is going to be talking to us about, even though that he's on the cross, about the difference between him and the world. In verse 25, you see the world's selfish ministry. It says in verse 25, therefore, the soldiers did these things. Now, the, the, these things was that they crucified him. They nailed him to the, they took the Son of God and nailed him to a cross. That they uh, divided up his garments, the stuff that belonged to him. They tried to divide him. We talked about that last week. But that's the ministry of the world. That's what the world does. That's how the world does things. Those who reject Jesus do so because they're the proud and that's why they reject him, because they don't believe that there is a God, or they don't want a God to rule over them. And they're usually the proud and the prestigious are the individuals, like the soldiers. They, they were soldiers, and they were following their orders, and they had swords, and they could do whatever they want. And so they're a representation of, the, of that group of people. But the wealthy have difficulty coming to know God. In Luke 18, as Jesus is talking with a, a rich young ruler about what he has to do, the rich young ruler asked Jesus, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, keep the commandments. And he says, I've been doing that. Do I need to do anything else? And Jesus said, yeah. You need to sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. And he went away very sorrowful. And then Jesus makes this statement. He says, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus understands that wealth may keep people from coming to, to know him because they're going to be more occupied in their wealth and in their material possessions than they are in God. He says, For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Rich people, prestigious people, have difficulty believing in Jesus, but they're not the only ones. The wise people have difficulty. In Matthew 11 and verse 25, where Jesus talks about if you, if, uh, you are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. Right before that, he says in verse 25, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. What that means is not that Jesus has dumb or stupid people, 
What it means is that if you're arrogant and you're wise and you're proud and you think you know it all, then you're not going to come to Jesus. You're not going to come to Him. It's just like most of the famous scientists that you can think of weren't believers. They didn't believe in God. They didn't think they needed God. They were too intelligent to believe in God. They had it all figured out how we got here without God. They were the wise. They were the intelligent ones. And so they, they had difficulty coming to Jesus. In Isaiah 5 and verse 21, he says, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. In other words, they think they're really wise. They think they're really clever. And they don't come to Jesus. The prestigious have difficulty coming to Jesus. In John chapter 7 and verse 40, 47 through 49, the, the Pharisees, who you remember there, the elite, prestigious religious group of their day. They're looked at as the strictest group of religious followers of God. And it says in verse 47, And the Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? Talking about people who believed in Jesus. He says, No one of the rulers of the Pharisees have believed in Him, has he? But this crowd which does not know the law is accursed. So he says, see, we're too prestigious. We know too much to actually believe in Jesus. And it's interesting that they're religious people. They're the religious people of Jesus' day, but they're unwilling to accept him because there's a difference between being religious and following Jesus. There's a difference between being part of a church and actually following Jesus. And some people think they get to Jesus by being part of the right church and they're out looking for the right church instead of looking for Jesus and Jesus will make sure they're in the right church. And the nobles have difficulty believing in Jesus. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 3 through 5, you have, remember the story of Herod, right? Herod killed John the Baptist. Remember why he killed John the Baptist? Because John the Baptist told him his marriage was in violation of what God said and he, he wasn't allowed to have her. And then his daughter danced for him and he promised her something. And that's what happened in, in Matthew 14 and verse 3. It says, For when Herod had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had been saying to, to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Uh, although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. So those religious, prestigious people, the nobles who think they know everything and have the right to do everything, they wanted to kill Jesus. And many of them do today. They put Jesus to death. And you might say, well, how can they do that? Jesus isn't around. Because they tell you, you don't have to listen to Him. There's no God. Don't believe the Bible. Don't listen to the Word of God. You know, it, it's fake. It's old. Uh, it, it's written by a bunch of men. And so why in the world should you believe it? The other example is in Acts chapter 26. When King Agrippa was listening to Paul, and Paul was talking to him about Jesus, and uh, Paul says to him, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would wish to God that, every, that whether in a short or a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am except for these chains. Paul says, yes, I'm trying to convince you to become a Christian. Yes, you, you need to be saved. Your status in the world doesn't make you right with God. You need to accept the cross of Jesus. Don't crucify Jesus on the cross like those soldiers did. And so they reject Him. And why is it they reject Him? Because they're unwilling to humble themselves to believe in Him. They're proud. And the proud won't humble themselves. In Proverbs 11 and verse 2 it says... When pride comes, then comes dishonor. But with the humble is wisdom. They're unwilling to humble themselves before God. They're unwilling to say to God, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. In Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 23, it says, A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. But in that verse, it doesn't just simply talk about the soldiers, but it talks about those who are following him. And in order to follow Him, one has to become foolish. And what that means is not that one has to become an idiot or one has to become stupid, but what it means is, is one has to quit being proud. They have to quit thinking they know everything. And they have to listen to what God says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 18, it says, Let no one deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. See, God can't fill up jars that are already filled up. If we think we know everything, if we think we have it all figured out, if we think we have all the answers, then we're not going to listen to God. 
And so in order to become one of God's people, we have to become foolish. We have to say, Lord, I don't know it all. Lord, how is a person saved? Lord, who are you? Lord, how do I know you're there? Lord, speak to me and talk to me, and God will. And so there were those who followed Jesus. The verse continues by saying, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and, uh, and Mary Magdalene. You might say, well, where are the disciples? The men are terrified. And the men are in hiding. Because the men don't want the same fate that happened to Jesus, and they're confused. And so they went and hid themselves. So it was the women who were standing there, because the women were less likely to be arrested rather than the men were. But there were these women that followed Jesus. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 2 it says, And also some women had been, uh, had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses, and Mary who was called Magdalene from, from whom seven demons had gone out, and, Jonas, the, uh, and Jonah the mother of, of uh, Chusa, Herod's steward, and, and Susanna, and many others were contributing uh, to their support out of their private means. So there were individuals who willingly submitted themselves to God because they saw God work in their lives. They saw what God did in their lives. In this case, there was a woman whose name was Mary, uh, and who uh, uh, was also called uh, uh, Magdalene, and she had seven demons cast out of her. And so they took note of that. And by the way, even though she's the one that had the demons cast out, other people that heard about it, they submitted themselves to God. So the rulers and the wise people and the soldiers and all of them, they have no excuse. They can't say, well, we didn't know who he was. They heard the stories. They might have even seen some of the people. The, the uh, religious people certainly talked to, to Lazarus when uh, Lazarus was raised from the dead. They talked to the blind man that Jesus healed. And rather than believing the blind man, they rejected him because they didn't want to believe the conclusions of believing in him, which was that Jesus really was from God. But his people followed him. And here's what I want you to understand. They're generally the cultured outcasts. They're those who the world don't, doesn't really think much of. I've never seen Randy on television. I doubt if they're going to do anything about Randy's life on television. Because he's just like the rest of us. He's not famous. He's not somebody that everybody should know. He hasn't done some great feat that the world should, should think about. Although I, I, I did learn that he was a dragster racer one time. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26, it says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble who were called. So it's not the famous, it's not the prestigious, it's not the nobles who are generally going to come to, to Jesus. That's not who's going to come to Him. The people that are going to come to Him are those who recognize that they need God in their life. Those, re, uh, those were rejected by culture. In John 4 and verse 9, you remember when Jesus went to the woman at the well? You remember what the woman at the well said when Jesus talked to her? The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? In other words, she's saying, Jesus, do you really know who you're talking to here? Do you realize that I am a five-time divorcee? You know, I've been married five times. I'm living with a guy. You Jewish people don't have anything to do with people like me. And not only that, but you're a man and I'm a woman. And in their culture, the women walked in the back. You remember that? But that's who Jesus went to. And that's why when you, when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, what follows or what precedes the Sermon on the Mount, we call the Beatitudes. And when you look at those Beatitudes and you read some of them, they're not the qualities that the world admires. They're not the attributes that the world says, you be like this and we will make you famous or you'll become famous. Listen to what they are. He opened his mouth and, and began to teach them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Really? Why my self-help books and my positive thinking books says I'm supposed to think good of myself. I'm supposed to think positive of myself. I'm supposed to realize who I am and I have potential and I can go out there and I can do stuff. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. They're the ones that are going to get the kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn. Really? 
People go around mourning all the time. They're the, they're the ones who are going to make famous Jesus. He says, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle. Those who are willing to submit to other people. They don't tell other people what to do. They don't want to be the bosses. They don't want to shove people around. They don't want to big, make a big name for themselves. And you can go on to the rest of the list and you find out those are the kind of characters that a person has to have who's going to come to Jesus. It's not the proud. It's not the, ele- it's, it's not the elegant. It's not the people with big swords and big guns. Because they humbly follow Jesus' lead. That's what they do. Remember, they supported Jesus. Out of their own means, they supported Jesus. Remember when Jesus was asked, I want to follow you, Lord, and Jesus says, I don't have a house. Well, where do you live? People willingly supported him, took care of him. These women took care of him. And they followed him. And why did they follow him? Because he had something that nobody else has. He had something that the prestigious will not have. He has something that the world will not, will not have. He has something that only he has. In John chapter 6 and verse 68, after Jesus made a number of statements about his flesh and his blood, and a lot of his disciples left him because they were thinking he was teaching cannibalism, and they left him, and his 12 disciples were left there, and he says to them, are you going to leave? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have, to, and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now I want you to understand when Peter said that, Peter wasn't saying, Lord, I understood everything you just said about eating your flesh and drinking your blood. Peter might have been going, oh, that's disgusting. I would never do that. And even though he might not have understood it, and even though he might have been disgusted about it, he understood one thing. There's only one place where you're going to find the words of eternal life. And that's in Jesus. <coughs> And that's why they're willing to follow Him. That's why these women were willing to stand at the cross looking up to Him, still trying to minister Him the best that they could as they're seeing Him crucified and dying on that cross. But Jesus has a loving ministry. He doesn't have a selfish ministry like the world. In verse 26 it says, and remember that as I read this for you, Jesus has been mistreated. He has been crucified. He has been flogged. He's been nailed up on a cross by His creation. By the very people He made and the very people He gives life to and breath to and the strength to wield that hammer and hit those nails, this Jesus as he's on that cross suffering, does this. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the, to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own household. Why, I know what I'd be thinking about if I was on that cross. I know what I'd be wanting to happen on that cross. If I was there crucified and those soldiers were down there dividing my garments, I know what I'd be saying to them. But that's because we're not like Him. And the first thing that might come to your mind is, well, why not His brothers? Why not charge His brothers? And the reason is because at this time, as Jesus being crucified, His brothers didn't even believe in Him. In John chapter 7 and verse 5, they don't believe in Him. Often, Christian brothers are more helpful and more of a blessing to widow ladies and those in distress than their own families are. And so as Jesus is looking at his mom and knowing that she's going to need some help because he's going to be gone, he ministers to her. In John 10 and verse 27, Jesus says, And my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. See, that's why Jesus says to the disciple whom he loved, Behold your mother. So one of his disciples, he says, You're your mother. You take care of her for me. When you visit a widow, you're taking care of God's widows. When you visit orphans, you're taking care of God's orphans. 
When you visit somebody who's lonely, you're taking care of God's lonely person. It's God that we're serving. It's God that is going to receive a blessing from us. And so they willingly followed Him. In Luke 9 and verse 23 it says, And He, and he was saying to, to them all, If anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow Me. You see, that's the difference between the proud and the arrogant and prestigious. They're going to do what they want. The lowly and the humble are going to do what God wants. And they're going to willingly submit to His rule. And they're going to follow Him, not because they are laws and rules, but because they're trying to trust in the God who loves them and takes care of them. And so Jesus gave us His example of caring for somebody who was going to be in need. And at a time when He was in the greatest agony and greatest distress that anybody could be in, He didn't think about Himself. He thought about others. How often are we hard on our children when they come to us at a time when we're in distress or in anguish or trouble and we lash out at them. And yet Jesus provides for His mother. Because Jesus was showing us what true religion really is on that cross. In verse 27 of James chapter 1, it says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And I don't think the order that God gave that in was just an accident or coincidence. Because you see, you can try to have your sins forgiven, but if you don't have the heart of Jesus... If you're not concerned about widows and orphans and those people that are in in distress, it doesn't matter if you think you have your sins forgiven. Because you don't have the heart of God. That's what Jesus was trying to tell that rich young ruler that came to him and says, what must I do to have eternal life? The young man says, I've kept myself from sin. Jesus goes, great. But you're rich and there's poor people. What have you done about it? And so Jesus gave us an example of honoring His mother and His father. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 16, it says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be prolonged and that, you may, uh, that it may go well with you on the land which the Lord your God has given you. God says we're to provide for our parents when they get older and we're to take care of them. And I know that means sometimes in our culture putting them in some place where they can be provided for better than we can do on our own. But we make sure they're provided for. We make sure they're cared for. If we don't have the resources to do that, then we do whatever we can to make sure they have what they need. If that means us living with them, then that's what we do. And Jesus was dying. And as He was dying, He knew that His mother's needs wouldn't end just because He's dying. He said, I need to make sure that she's taken care of. Well, Jesus had nothing except disciples. And so Jesus commissions one of His disciples to care for His mother and provide for her. But that's not the only statement you find on the cross. You find a statement of what I'd like to call for you or would suggest to you is spiritual care. And you might say, well, where's that? Why don't you look at verse 28 with me of John 19. It says, after this, Jesus knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the Scripture. He said, I am thirsty. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it, and brought it up to his mouth. And it's interesting that he has this little statement. Because the first thing you're thinking is, sure, if I was on the cross and I was dying, I would be thirsty too. And certainly it's talking about the obvious physical reality of the fact that he had thirst. And there were verses that actually describe the physical thirst that he would have on the cross. In Psalm chapter 22 and verse 15, that psalm that talked about them dividing up his garments, it also says, My strength is dried up like a pot shed, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and, uh, and you lay me in the dust of death. In other words, he's thirsty, and as a result of thirst, what happens? We die, don't we? In Psalm 69, in verse 21, it says, And they also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. We get thirsty. And certainly Jesus got thirsty. 
But what I find interesting is there's not too many times in the Bible where it says Jesus was thirsty or Jesus was hungry. There's a few, but there's not very many. And so when Jesus says, I'm thirsty, maybe we need to take a closer look at it and try to figure out exactly what he has in mind because Jesus on that cross represented sinful man. That's what he represented on that cross. We look at him and put him up there as God, but he was representing sinful man. He was dying as a sinful man. He was suffering the, the anguish and the, the uh, consequences of being a sinful man. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5 and 6 tells us that. Where it says, But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourgings we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He says when Jesus was suffering on that cross, he was suffering as a sinner. He was suffering as us. So maybe there's something more than just him saying, I'm thirsty. Because I'd suggest to you it's not just a physical description of the fact that he's thirsty. But to any person who's had any time reading that Old Testament, they come across places where God deals with thirst. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 29 and verse 6, For the Lord of hosts you will be punished with thunder. Or from the Lord of hosts you will be punished with thunder. An earthquake and loud noise with whir with a whirlwind and tempest and a flame of consuming fire. So God's mad at somebody, isn't he? See what happens. And the multitude of all the nations will wage war against Ariel. Ariel is just another name for Jerusalem or God's, ca or God's capital. Even all who wage war against her and her stronghold. And, uh, and who distress her will be like a dream, a vision of the night. It will be as when a hungry man dreams and behold he is eating, but when he awakens his hunger is not satisfied. Or as when a thirsty man dreams and... Uh, uh, sorry. Apparently I left the verse up here. Let me read it for you. Let me find it and read it for you. In Isaiah 20, uh, 29 says this it will be as when a hungry man dreams and behold he is eating but when, a, uh, but when he awakens his hunger is not satisfied or when a thirsty man dreams and behold he is drinking and when he awakens behold he is faint and his, and his thirst is not quenched thus the multitude of all the nations will be who wage war against God So why is Jesus thirsty on the cross? Because he's representing individuals who wage war against God. That's what's going to happen to them as they're there waging war. When they wage war, they're going to get thirsty because this world can't provide for us what it is that satisfies every desire that we have. In the book of Amos, in Amos chapter 8 and verse 11, God's talking about a famine which deals with food. He says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a famine for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. So God says there's going to be a time when people aren't hearing the words of the Lord. And he says, People will stagger from sea to sea and from the north even to the east, and they will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day the beautiful virgin and the young men will faint from thirst. Why, when Jesus is on that cross, does he say, I'm thirsty? Because he wants people to understand that this is what happens to people who don't listen to the word of God. People who are against God, they're going to be thirsty. Not just physically thirsty, but they're going to be thirsty. But God is saying, I can satisfy that thirst for you. Remember in the Old Testament? Bill reminded us of it. When the children were in the wilderness and they needed water. And God got it from the rock. Nehemiah, when he is restoring the kingdom of God in the law, he says in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 15, to help remind the people of the fact that God's with them, he says, you provided bread from heaven. For them from their hunger. Talking about people in the Old Testament. You brought forth water from a rock 
for, for them for, for their thirst. And you told them to enter in order to possess the land which you swore to give to them. The only reason the children of Israel were, were able to make it from Egypt to the promised land was because they had drink. And where did that physical drink come from at that time? A rock. It came from a rock. That's where it came from. In Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 21, it says, You did not thirst when He led them through the, through the desert. He made the water flow out of a rock for them. He split the rock and the water gushed forth. How were they satisfied? By a rock. Well, that's just a physical representation of our spiritual condition. We're thirsty outside of God. In Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 17, it says, The afflicted and the needy are seeking water, but there is none. And their tongue is parts with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them myself as the God of Israel. I will not forsake them. I will open up rivers of the bare height on the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. God says, I'm going to provide what man needs. I'm going to give them what, what will allow them to live. And so when Jesus was talking to that woman at the well, that outcast lady who was desperate for something to drink, she came to the, to the well to get some water. Jesus turned her attention from physical water to spiritual water. And he says to her in verse 10, And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who, was saying, uh, who says to you, Give me a drink, you would ask Him, and He would give you living water. He'll give you water that you'll have forever. You'll never need any more water. When you come to Jesus, you find everything you need in Him. We find that relationship with God that sometimes is so, we are so desperately seeking. And someone who loves us that we're so desperately seeking. And somebody who cares about us. We find it in Jesus. God provides for our spiritual thirst. He leads them to living water. In Isaiah 49 and verse 10, he says, they will, not, uh, uh, they will not hunger or thirst, nor will the scorching heat or sun strike them down. For he who has compassion on them will lead them, and he will guide them to his springs of water. I will, uh, uh, I will make all my mountains a road, and my highway will be raised up. Behold, these will come from afar, uh, and lo, these will come from the north and from the west, and these from the land of uh, Sinem, Shout for joy, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth. Break forth into joyful shouting, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted His people and will have compassion on His affliction. God says, I will satisfy your need since you guys left the garden. I'm the one who's going to satisfy you. It's not going to be work. It's not going to be your family. It's not going to be your friends. Jesus says, I'm the one who's going to do it. It's not going to be your possessions or the amount of money that you have. God says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to give it to you. You know, people argue in Exodus chapter 17 about whether, whether um, uh, in, in one of the incidents when God told Moses to go strike the rock or speak to the rock, and some people say, well, Moses got in trouble because he spoke to the rock or he, he, he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock. You remember that? If you've been in the church for a while, you've heard that, and people spend a lot of time talking about that. Look at Exodus 17, 6 says. This is one of the times when he brought water from the rock. He says, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. You know how God got water from the rock? He struck it. And one of the other verses we said said, The mountain split in half. You see, it wasn't just a little fountain. It wasn't just this little trickle of water. It had to be a river of water that was big enough to give over a million people a drink. And he struck the rock. And as Jesus is there on the cross, and he reminds them of their condition outside of Christ, you're going to thirst.
John 19 and verse 34 says that after Jesus died, it says, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. God provides the water for his children to survive. And not just physical water. Did you notice that when Jesus asked for thirst, was thirsty, the soldiers came and they filled a, 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 a sponge with sour wine? What do I care what it was? Why in the world should I care if it's sour wine or not? Why, why in the world does that matter that I know it's sour wine? There's not a lot of places where it tells us what Jesus drank. You know any places where it tells us what Jesus drank other than maybe water? No. There's a reason why it's telling us this. It says, and a jar full of sour wine was, was standing there, so they, put it, uh, uh, so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon the, uh, a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. You see, the world can't offer what we need. In John 4 and verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. Everybody who thinks this world is going to supply what they need is going to need it again. How many times have you said to your wife or, or when you've gone out to a restaurant, Oh, I'm so full, I can't eat anymore. And what happens when they bring the dessert tray around? <laughs> or you think to yourself, I got a job, I finally found what I needed. And you get laid off. Well, the economy shoots up and my wife tells me that now a jar of pickles is $8. Yeah. The world can't satisfy what we need. You see, they offer sour wine. Remember Jesus' first miracle? What was Jesus' first miracle? He turned water into wine. He took that ordinary water that you and I drink, we appreciate God giving us that water. But we really like flavored water, don't we? We like our flavor in our water. Maybe put a little lemon in it, maybe put a little orange in it. They had wine, and the Bible says that wine makes the heart merry. God took that ordinary stuff and He made it something that we enjoy. He made our relationships so that we would enjoy them, Adam and Eve. He made children so we would enjoy them. He made the government so we could all live together. He, everything God made, He made so we would enjoy it. And that's the reason that He turned that water into wine. They were out of enjoyment. The party was still going on and nobody was drinking anything. And after he made it, the guy who tasted it said this, Every man serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus is the only one who can make your life happy. Jesus is the only one who can take a wrecked marriage and make it good. Jesus is the only one who can take sinful people and have them live together in love and compassion. Jesus is the only one who can do that. No self-help book in the world, no psychologist outside of Jesus, no psychiatrist, and no drug is going to help you do that. And no gizmo or gadget that we get is going to satisfy us. But the world turns wine into vinegar. In Isaiah 5 and verse 20, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. You see, it's good if you have an affair every once in a while. It'll keep your marriage exciting. It's good if you want to have an open marriage. It's good if you want to be a swinger. They take what God has given us and they turn it into something wicked and evil and sinful. They take the good wine that God has blessed us with and they turn it into sour vinegar. 
says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink. It happens at every college frat party in the world. Let's see who can drink the most. Let's get a funnel and pour it up there. We're going to have fun. And they turn what God has given us into wickedness. Who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away the rights of the one who are in the right just to make a little bit more money. But Jesus is the answer for thirst. That's why in Matthew 5 and verse 6 the first beatitude was blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or they'll be filled. God's the one who can help us. God's the one who provides for us. And so as Jesus talks about being thirsty on that cross, He's trying to help them understand that if you're a sinner, you're going to always be thirsty for something. You're going to be looking for things to try to satisfy it. A better job, a better wife, the woman at the well had five, got rid of all of them, started living with the guy. That wasn't even enough. Money, property, things, possessions, winning arguments, being in the right political side. That's why it says in Psalms 42 and verse 1 that what we really thirst for and what people don't really understand is that we thirst for God. Psalms 42 and verse 1, it says, As the deer pants for the watered brooks, so my soul pants for you, O Lord, or God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And the thirsty will never thirst in Jesus. In Jeremiah 2 and verse 13, it says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. I don't care what this world offers you. It's not going to satisfy you until you get right with God. If you haven't, if you haven't been baptized in Jesus Christ, if you haven't acknowledged Him as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't decided to do His will, nothing else is going to help. Nothing else is going to meet that inner need that we have. In John chapter 7 and verse 38, it says, He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Have you ever noticed that in the Old Testament they have that section in the book of Ezekiel that you read and you go, huh? It's when they're building that temple. And they're making and they're measuring. And they spend a lot of time measuring the temple. And then after the temple gets built, he says there's this river that goes out from it. And it's kind of small when it first goes out, but the bigger it gets and the further it gets, it's more and more and it's deeper and deeper and wider and wider. And people read that and they scratch their head and they go, what in the world is that talking about? It's talking about you. It's talking about that from the temple of God came 12 men who were taught by Jesus. And those 12 men began to teach other people about Jesus. And those people began to teach other people about Jesus. And those people began to teach other people about Jesus until we have more than 12 people in this room who are followers of Jesus. And the further you get from the temple, the more the river expands because it's living water. And Jesus has a third statement. He says it's finished. But when he says it's finished, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. In Matthew 27 and verse 50, it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. See, when Jesus says it's finished, he means it's accomplished. I've done it. Remember, he's going to prepare a kingdom for his people, isn't he? 
In order for him to prepare that kingdom up there, he has to die for us because God's kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness. And by the way, that's the only kingdom, that's the only kind of kingdom you would want. You don't want to live in a kingdom where there's rebellion and cruelty and, and murder. You want a righteous kingdom. Well, if there's a righteous kingdom and I'm not righteous, somebody has to do something for me and Jesus says, I'll do it. And so when he died on that cross, he was dying for me so that I could enter into that kingdom. And that's why when he died, it says the veil of the temple was torn in two. And that means that for the very first time, the priests that were working in the room where the showbread was and the, and the incense was could see the Ark of the Covenant inside. They could see the very presence of God. And they were so terrified, they made a new curtain and hung it up. Because they didn't understand that Jesus died for our sins. You see, he opened the way for man to communicate with God. In Ephesians 1 and verse 9, it says, And he made known to us the mystery of his will. This is what God's always been wanting. According to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration of this, uh, suitable to the fullness of time, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. Who's in the heavens? God is. Who's on the earth? We are. What did Jesus do? He summed up. He brought together what was in heaven and what was on earth. He brought together. And He removed the enmity. In Ephesians 2 and verse 14, He says, For He Himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by, accomplished, by uh, abolishing in His flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandment contained in ordinance, so that in Himself He might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it, having put to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Jesus died to get us right. And he's our propitiation. He's that payment that was given so that we might have fellowship with God. In Hebrews chapter 9, beginning at verse 22. Speaking about the difference between the old temple ritual and what Jesus came to do. He says in Hebrews 9 and verse 22, And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these, for Christ did not enter into a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered the holy place year by year with blood that is not their own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he, he has been manifest to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It's finished. It's accomplished. He did it. And after he does that, he rules. In Hebrews 1 and verse 3 it says, And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. And when He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And He made a highway for us. It's finished. You ever gone somewhere and you check on Google? If there's construction. Because you don't want to run into construction, right? Because it's going to slow you down. And the road might not even be finished. Well, God was constructing a highway. From the time that Adam and Eve left the garden to the time that Jesus went up to heaven, He's constructing a highway. And Isaiah 35 puts it like this. The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the arabo will rejoice and blossom like a crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice and rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be, uh, will be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord. The majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious hearts, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but He will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. 
Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy, for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Araba. The scorching land will become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The, uh, in the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass, becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. And the unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for those who walk that way, and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and, go, and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads, and they will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing. We'll flee away. If you haven't been baptized in Jesus... You haven't drunk of the waters, the living waters, and you're still thirsty. Maybe you're waiting. It's always up to you. But when you realize the world's not going to offer you what you want, come drink and get into the highway of the Lord. We can aid or help you in any way. We ask you to come forward while together we stand and while we sing. Oh, we've got to conclude the sentence. There you go. All right. Please stay. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Uh, I got a card from Gigi that says she'd like us to pray for her niece, uh, Jen Elaine, I believe. And she's having uh, board exams uh, this coming August the 20th, and so she'd like us to pray for her that that would be successful. Uh, also, uh, please uh, pray for those who recently lost someone, Troy's family. Pray for them because they, they have COVID. I haven't heard anything different from them. Remember Walter, if you would, that's up there. And Annette's granddaughter, Naomi, who has been going, uh, who will be going through a brain surgery tomorrow. So keep her in your prayers, if you wouldn't. Also remember Troy and Kevin and all those who do long hauls. I think you know everything else that's up there. Oh, uh, Bill Myers called. He had to go to emergency uh, yesterday because uh, he couldn't breathe very well. So they gave him a treatment, and he's doing better, and he's at home. But he wanted you to know that that's where he's at. Appreciate all of you being here, and pray God blesses you for having been here with us. Thank you.